I'm joined by our political con contributor, Chris Yulman. Chris, great to see you as always. This, this story, Musk v the government, a range of different elements to this. You've got free speech versus in, enforcing some standards. The political battle, government versus a tech billionaire, is there any downside for the government in having that fight? Well, uh, we're in a completely new world now, aren't we, on a couple of levels. In 2007, with the arrival of the iPhone, we changed broadcasting once and forever, which was that everyone in the world became a broadcaster at the same time. Listening to, to the opposition talking then about, you know, pubs, well, you don't carry around a pub in your pocket, right? The issue now is that this is ubiquitous. And we're also facing tech titans that have market capitalisation, which is larger than most countries. So you think about a company like Apple, its market capitalisation is $2.5 trillion. Australia's GDP is $1.7. So, so they would make the G7 and we don't. So we and, and they're not domiciled here, right? So you're now dealing with someone who is offshore, who is completely cashed up and making an argument about free speech, an argument I would normally go along with. But the rules everywhere have changed. We have erased the ground rules that we once knew and we have rebased them and we are now in an era where we are trying to ca catch up. I can't think of a more wicked public policy dilemma uh, in, in the last few decades. And, and we saw how wicked some of the elements of this are in the wake of, let's go back to the Bondi atrocity and then you, you had the, the Wakeley attack as well, but some of the misinformation around that, and I know that you and I were d discussing before we came onto air, one particular case of an individual uh, online, he calls himself the Aussie Cossack, mm but basically a Putin propagandist. Yep. And he is domiciled in the, the Russian consulate right now. Yeah, Sydney, hiding from the police. Hiding from the police and just throwing out misinformation. Yeah, and think about this. So the, on the night of the Bondi stabbing, this guy, Simeon Boykov, who goes by the name, his Twitter handler is Ozzy Cossack, is sitting, hiding from the police on an assault charge in the Russian consulate in Sydney when at around about 11pm he puts out a tweet retweeting that this uh, a Jewish student called Benjamin Cohen was suspect. And now, it was an anti-Semitic tweet. It was a lie. It was deliberate. He got 400,000 views of that, and that ro rolls on to the point where Channel 7 rebroadcasts it. Now, that is an act of information warfare. It must be at least condoned by the Russian government, otherwise they would punt him into the street. You honestly believe mm. that they don't know what he's doing in there. And this is the insidious thing. It's not just other governments, it's organised crime. So in, in your child's pocket now is a weapon of warfare and a weapon of crime, as well as all the benefits it brings. So should, should our authorities just let this slide or how do they respond? How should they respond to that? Well, look, I'm going to ask that question today. I've got the opportunity to see what they think about Simeon Boykov, see if they do think that this is an act of aggression by a foreign country. And if it is, you know, it's, it is essentially an act of information warfare. It's designed to divide our community. There should be some repercussions for that. At least the, the Russian government should be surely called to account maybe ask them to punt him into the street and he can deal with the New South Wales police on his assault charge and perhaps there's a case for a foreign interference charge against the man as well. So I think that needs to be looked at. But I think that at every level, they're going to talk about corporations today, there are parental guidelines that need to be put in place. Yeah. People need to start working out how they deal with this with their own children. And is it any wonder that we're seeing such an increase in depression in young people today? Totally. Yeah. They're now in an era which we've never dealt before. And it's going to get worse yeah. because we now have artificial intelligence. We won't know what to believe yeah. in what we see. And the other point, and, and I saw Mark Owen Jones, he's a, an expert in this space. It's not just this individual, Simeon Boykov. There were other... Um, uh, Twitter handles with less than 100 followers putting out this terrible information, misinformation about the young Jewish man, and then it gradually snowballed and then this other person with a bigger profile, the Aussie Cossack, puts it out there and it gets global traction. Yeah. And I was in Ukraine last year and, and spoke to the president there and, and to people around him. And a big part of what's going on there is information warfare. And when we talk about the defence of this country, for example, I think we talk too much about subs and planes. We need to start talking about the war that is actually raging right now inside our borders, about the attacks that we're seeing on critical infrastructure about the what we're seeing in an information war. And I think if there is an information there is an information war raging at the moment, China's involved in it, 
the, uh, Russia's certainly involved in it. And if Australia's playing in that game, I've yet to see it. And we desperately need to be defending ourselves against this sort of stuff and attacking where we need to. It's important to have, and we discussed this last week, but a, a sense of who we are and what we stand for. And in that context, it's a good thing the Prime Minister's on the Kokoda track right now, isn't it, alongside yeah. his PNG counterpart? Absolutely, and particularly at a time when we're seeing China on the rise in that neck of the woods to reaffirm Australia's deep, deep friendship with Papua New Guinea is very important. Uh, you having flashbacks to Kevin 06, not Kevin 07, when he was on that trail with, with Joe Hockey. And what did Joe Hockey say about that? You rescued him from a river. He should have let him drown. Now, I'm sure that that <laughs> probably won't happen again. But I'm glad the Prime Minister is there. You know, there are certain parts of our history which are, are, are really important to give credit to and to do honour to and remembering those uh, Australians and Papua New Guineans who fought against the Japanese in that war is extremely important. E echoes of history and a few other things we're seeing right now as well. If you look at the Columbia University protest mm -hmm. and then in Sydney, solidarity out of the Sydney University, I'm sure at other institutions as well, you think back to the Vietnam War and those sorts of periods and the difficult moments around that. But this is really, again, it's quite a tipping point for a lot of issues, not the least of which is the anti-Semitism which has erupted in recent months and yeah, is dangerous. I, I think that's it. The thing about this that, that makes it different for me is the anti-Semitism which seems to be rife in all of this. And, and I can understand university students who get angry about wars. I, I was the son of a soldier who served in Vietnam, a, a lifelong soldier. And I remember vividly the moratoriums when we moved to South Australia in the 1970s. There was some really serious violence too. The moratoriums are mostly peaceful, but some, some big university... Uh, uh, riots at the time, and don't forget Kent State in the United States, where students were actually shot by the National Guard there. So, you know, we've seen violence on university campuses before. It seems to me, though, that some of these students make strange bedfellows with Hamas. I can understand the grief that they would have about the, the, the war that we're seeing rage at the moment. I think there'll be a reckoning with the Israeli government at some stage. Benjamin Netanyahu was asleep at the wheel. Uh, when that happened, and and the intelligence head has since resigned, so you know there will be a reckoning there, but uh, but but I think the students should really go and have a long hard look at Hamas and wonder whether or not they should be throwing their lot in with that crowd. In, indeed, when you look at, we talk about all sorts of issues, whether it be issues uh, relating to to the gay community or whatever else, or the treatment of women. Exactly, you look at Hamas a bit closer and, and see how. They treat people in terms of, and also look at Israel a bit yeah. more closely. The secular, many secular Jews and those who are not hardliners, those in the kibbutz who were attacked on October seven, uh, these are people who are not the sort of individuals who'd be saying just kill every civilian. Yeah, and look, and again, over time you see the change in the stance of political parties. Now, you know, I'm old enough again to remember that when the Labor Party was a huge supporter of the State of Israel, Doc Evert was responsible, essentially, for the committee that set up the partition there and and it was, uh, it was Australia was the first country in the world to vote for it. So, you know, the first two companies, yeah. abs countries abstained. So, you know, there, it, is a, it is a long road that they have been on and now they find themselves between their own base, between the Greens, and, uh, and, and some electoral realities. So the Labor Party at the moment is bouncing from one foot to the other on this particular issue. And the problem that you've got there is that if you don't know where to stand, you stand for nothing. Yep, indeed. And uh, finally, I'll let you go in a minute, but the CPI out today, this is where a lot of our political battle is going to be, the yeah. economy, the budget and rates, the trajectory of those rates over coming months. Yeah, and the short-term problem for Jim Chalmers is inflation. Obviously, if he pours more fuel onto the fire of the economy, then it'll burn harder the time that the Reserve Bank is trying to dampen the economy. So he, he can't push too hard. Don't forget that, you know, he wants interest rates to come down before the next election. The Australian electoral cycle is short, so the first interest rate cut might not come until maybe March, April, May next year. It starts to get very close to the next election. So he'll be worried about making sure that interest rates don't go up before then. Indeed, that is cutting it fine. Chris Yulman, great to chat. We'll see you next week. Take care.